we'll get started right away. I'm sure we're going to have a couple more people roll in. Um, my name is Dave Norwood. Uh, I'm the president of, here at TNS. I'm actually going to do the first part of the presentation, but I am very technical. I used to be an engineer. It is training, um, so don't be afraid that because of what I do now, I still have got a lot of experience in the storage arena, etc. Um, the other person presenting this morning is Doug Calhoun. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know I do. And I screw up your last name sometimes. I say... I don't care. Yeah, exactly. So Doug and I go back, believe it or not, I can't say his last name, but we go back 10 years. We've actually been working together on storage specifically for 10 years. And I'll, I'll let Doug give you a little more of his background, but um, what I can say is um, he's been doing this a long time in this role as a technical, um, a technical resource, whether it be a storage architect or um, storage engineer. Um, uh, the building blocks, and then Doug is going to dump in, jump into the performance and SS, uh, performance tiering, etc. And then finally, we'll have a Q and A at the end, and um, grab lunch, and then we'll send you on your day. You can still get some work done today. Um, my qualifications, as I mentioned before, sometimes it scares people like, oh, you're a sales guy, you're, you're uh, an you know, executive, you don't know anything. Um, I've actually been working with SAN for, SANS for 10 years. As I mentioned, Doug and I, Doug actually helped me sell my first SAN. And back then, it was $600,000, and it was a total of around 80 terabytes of storage. <laughs> For six hundred grand, um, so we've come a long way. Well, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But that means we've seen the progression and how the market has changed, and we can give a lot of insight on where we came from and where we're heading. Um, but I also am a teacher. I teach at the University of Utah. I'm an adjunct there, and I also teach at Weber State, um, both in technical teaching. So, so this again, even though my title may not reflect it, this is what I do. Um, so, all right. So let's start with the basics. What's the definition of a SAN? Um, it's really truly separating storage from compute, right? Your memory, your CPU is, is in one place and your storage is, is in another. Um, and, and another key feature of a SAN is its block level access. Meaning to the operating system, it looks like it's writing right to disk versus file level access like a file share where you're actually writing to a file level instead of at a block level. Um, some important features in a SAN, high availability. You put all your storage eggs in one basket. Now there's some great advantages of that. There's a reason we want to do that, but be careful because all your data is in one system. And if that one system goes down, not one server's down or two servers, possibly all your servers are down if that SAN is unavailable. So high availability is extremely important. But the beauty is, is you build that high availability into your storage once, and it covers all your servers, right? Instead of all the HA and overhead we do on one server, and then we've got to do all the, if it's, uh, if it's direct attached storage, then we've got to build all that high availability in another server, and then the next server. Here, we build that high availability in once into the SAN, and then it protects all our servers. So, but high availability, ex extremely important performance. All those servers are accessing the same pool of disk. So you better make sure you size that SAN appropriately for the number of disks. I've personally gotten in trouble with this before. As a customer will tell me, oh, we've got five servers and we want to condense it down to a SAN. And we, we really, each server's only got a few hundred um, meg on it, or sorry, a few hundred gig on it. You know, we add it all up and they only need two terabytes. Well, I can get you two terabytes in a couple hard drives, right? But in reality, they have five servers and each server has, you know, five five, eight hard drives in it, you know, small hard drives, they might have a total of 20 or 30 spindles, right? Hard drives. And if I go and I crush them down to two hard drives, yes, I've met their capacity, but I've fallen far short on their performance, right? So be really careful about that is um, because performance, yes, there's some fancy stuff we can do with caching and other technologies, uh, put a little SSD in front of it for performance. But in, in truth, long the, the overall performance of your SAN is a f truly a function of the number of spindles you have, right? Each spindle type has a certain number of IOPS. For example, a 7.2K drive has 80 IOPS, right? It can produce 80 uh, input or outputs at a t uh, in a second. 
right? Input output per second, IOPS. Um, a 10K drive can do around 120 IOPS. And a 15K drive can do around 180 IOPS. Now SSD is shaking this all up, right? Some of these SSDs can do tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of IOPS. Um, we're not going to get too deep into that till later. Um, Doug will touch on that. But my point of all this is, if you've got X number of drives times the type of drive it is, which is how many IOPS it is, that's how many IOPS you have. We can do these tricks with caching and et cetera, but your sustained throughput is going to be a function of those hard drives. So make sure you're pay paying attention to that performance. Expandability. We want to be able to keep on growing. I mean, <laughs> has anyone ever come to you and say, you give me too much storage, dude. Take some of that back. Right? It doesn't happen. Right? They're always coming saying, give me that next big chunk. So with your SAN, you want to make sure it's easily scaled. Right? And be able to add storage on demand. Um, and then management. Right? You need to be able to, now I've got all that storage in one place, I need to be able to manage that, of course. And then high utilization. This is a big deal on the total cost of your SAN. Okay? If you're raw, you buy... 10 terabytes of raw disk and you only get four usable, that's quite a bit of overhead, right? But that's actually a number you'll see from some sand manufacturers. I mean, you really need to understand how much usable you get per raw. Um, and that can um, really affect the true price of the sand. Right? A sand may look a little cheaper when you look at raw versus raw between two sands, or they may look the same price, but then you find out one is, is going to give you, out of that 10 terabytes, 7 terabytes usable, even with RAID overhead and everything else, and the other one's only going to give you 4 terabytes usable. Obviously, the one with 7 terabytes is a much better value. So be aware of usable, right? Because that's really what matters. The raw doesn't matter so much. It's what I get to use. All right, common design. <laughs> We build this design all the time, right? There should be a dot, dot, dot here, right? You know, many servers. Um, but we have a switching infrastructure. This could be fiber channel or iSCSI, or sometimes both, right? I got the and or over here. We've made designs where you've got your primary path is fiber channel and your backup path is iSCSI. Um, and we can do that on the compellent. Um, one of the sands we do. Um, I don't know if that's available on all sands, but I know it's available on some. Um, and then on the back end, we have the actual sand. And here's the two controllers, right? Now you'll notice the way I drew it is there's two physically separate controllers. This is the ultimate, right? Because this controller, anything happens to it. Someone pours a soda on it, right? I mean, it, it, the motherboard fries, the back plane fries. It doesn't matter. This second controller is completely independent. Now there is another model where we mash those two into one physical box. And they'll still say it's dual controllers, and it is. They have two controllers in the, in the one box, and there is some separation between them, but let's be blunt, they still are in one piece of share, uh, shared you know, power supply, um, back plane, the interconnect is all a single unit. Um, but that's fine for some environments, right? I mean, just be aware of there's two models for dual controllers, two truly separate dual controllers. These two could be in two different cabinets on two different power sources. Whereas when you have a single chassis, you don't have quite that level of redundancy, but you do have a, a level of redundancy. And then behind that, head, if you will, then we usually have storage shelves. And again, there should be, it could be a dot, 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 right? We keep on adding shelves as we need more storage. Any questions on that? Those that have SANS, is that kind of like what you're, by raise a hand, is that what yours looks like? Okay, all right, cool. All right, so real quick, just so we're all on the same page as far as categories. DAS, direct attached storage. It's sitting in the server. There's no pooling. We call those islands of storage, right? It, and we've seen it, right? Where we've had trapped storage. This server, we've got all kinds of ex uh, excess capacity. We've got, we've got terabytes open of storage. We've got a, one up front, a couple up front, one right here in the middle. Um, 
we have tons of, of extra capacity on one server, and then we go over to this other one and we're 98% full and we're starving for data, right, or space. Um, and that doesn't, they're, they're two separate pools of storage. There is no um, pooling of that, so you can't um, leverage that storage that's free on one server for another server. Um, but DAS is usually fast. Yeah, DAS is cheap. There's many good uses for, for, for DAS, um, for direct attached storage. Um, in fact, many people may have a SAN, but they might still have a few servers that are direct attached, especially like um, my DMZ server, right? I've got a web server or whatever. Let's put that out in the DMZ. I don't even want that attached to my internal SAN that has all my accounting data and all that. So, so DAS is a good technology, definitely um, uh, something that is in use and you should continue to use um, in those right situations. NAS, and this is a Dave Norwood bias, I'm not a fan of NAS. NAS is not my favorite. Um, I think there's a place for it, but to me, all NAS is is a prepackaged form of, of DAS. What a NAS is, is a file share. Right? So, in my humble opinion, if you spin up a Windows server and you share out some, some drives, right, you've got a NAS, right? It's network attached storage. You're accessing the files via SIFS if it's a Windows environment or NFS if it's perhaps a, a Unix or <coughs> Mac environment. But in the end, you're just doing file level access, right? You're saving up files and pulling down files. You're not writing at a block level. Um, but that's what a NAS is. And, and there are some advantages to NAS where they optimize that file sharing. And I know there's been people that have had very good success with do, using NAS NAS for even a VMware environment, etc. Who's the big NAS vendor out there? Anybody know who the? IOMega makes a lot. Right. There's a lot of them that make it, but who runs that? Kind of runs that environment or yeah. NetApp. Yeah. NetApp. Sure. That's NetApp's big story. Is they they're firm believers in in NAS. Um, the challenge with NetApp, again, I'm not trying to. I'm just giving you what I've seen is a lot of overhead. In, order, in other words, to make NAS function fast and be quick, they have that raw versus usable, their proportions are, are on the lower side. They don't have a real strong story there on raw versus usable. And that's because they have to do some, their Waffles file system has to be extremely high performing um, in order to kind of make up some of the shortcomings of, of file, uh, file level access. And then finally, the SAN, the storage area network, the true separation of storage. You have a host, which is the server, and it sees it as a locally attached drive. It's looking like it's just writing blocks, like it would, uh, uh, like DAS. For, to the server, DAS and SAN looks exactly the same. Um, and then again, it's that black file level. And then it's across a network, hence the name, area network, storage area network. Um, and that network today is fiber channel or ethernet. I mean, there's some exotic other things people do out here, but I would say 98% of the SANs out there are either um, iSCSI or ethernet on the front end with the connectivity to the host. Storage types, <coughs> you'll hear this a lot. Primary storage. Active online, fast, always available. This is usually when people are writing the data, right? When they first access something and, and update or they create that PowerPoint, like I was doing yesterday, creating this PowerPoint, that PowerPoint gets saved to the server that's active. Guess what? I, I exited it all day yesterday, this PowerPoint. Now I'm hitting it this morning. And after today, <laughs> I won't look at this PowerPoint for a long time. Um, probably not till the next time I do a storage event, six months, a year from now, and I'll just read it once and then plagiarize it and, and save it, you know, and, and won't even update it. It becomes secondary. So we could actually move to secondary storage, meaning it's limited access. I'm not hitting it all the time. Um, sometimes they push this to offline. Um, we're not seeing that as much. We're seeing more of a near line, meaning it's just on slower disk. It's not going to perform as well. Um, sometimes when we push it all the way off to tape or mag uh, magnetic optical, um, it actually takes manual intervention to get the files back. Um, so stale data is a very common of secondary. 
So data access, I've been uh, uh, talking about this for a while, but file level. We're writing to disk at the OS level. So we're, we're letting the operating system. So if you've got a share, your PC writes to that share. It doesn't determine block size or how it's laid out on the disk or any of that. It just sends it up to the operating system of that S Windows server or, or Unix server, whatever it is, that NAS device. Um, and it says, you write it. So here's the whole file. I pull down the whole file when I need to read it. And the operating system of that remote device does the writing to disk. Block level, on the other hand, is I control writing it to the disk. I, the, the, in this case, it's usually a server or your own PC, right? Your PC, when you write to your local disk, your C drive on your PC, you're doing block level access. And block level access is usually higher performing. You don't have that extra layer of another operating system that has to take the file and then write it down, right? As you remove layers, you increase performance. Um, and the two ways we see this block level is, again, fiber channel and iSCSI. Data types, structured and unstructured. Structured are databases. Great example is Exchange, SQL. Um, Oracle. Um, structured data meaning the application has some say in how the, the data is laid out on disk. Where unstructured data are just flat files, we call those, right? It's, it's your Word documents, your Excel spreadsheets, where the application has nothing to do with how the data is laid on disk. The application doesn't care, it just says, here's a file. You lay it out. Where Exchange and other database technologies, they actually have some say in how that data is laid on disk, and hence it's called structured data. Very different I.O. characteristics between these two, right? Um, and so you want to either have this separate or you want to have a SAN that can, can, can handle both types of I.O. because they are very different. These are usually linear, big reads, like you got a big video, multimedia, and I'm just going to sequentially read a whole bunch of data. Whereas a database, they're usually just grabbing, you know, all over, they're right, all over, they're, they're, they're high IOPS, very random how it reads um, relative, relatively to reading a big old video file, right, sequential. <coughs> Okay, drive types. SATA, we're seeing less and less of this. Back in the day, we've seen a lot of SATA. Um, SAS is one. SAS has really become the standard in our in the business environment for storage. Um, SATA, we're still seeing this in desktops, but we're seeing less and less of this in the server environment. And one of the main reasons is when we started using SATA in business apps, we started to see huge failure rates, extremely high failure rates. And the reason is, is when these drives were designed, they were designed for a low duty cycle. So if you looked at the specs and you looked at the mean time between failure, the mean time between failure might have said three years. And you look at, or five years, 10 years, whatever. And then you go and look at a SAS drive or SCSI, really it's serial attached SCSI is what SAS stands for. You look at a SCSI drive and it might have a 10 year mean time between failure as well, right? But the difference is they calculated this mean time between failure assuming a 20 to 30% duty cycle. Meaning it's being accessed only 20 to 30% of the time. Think of a desktop. Um, you get in in the morning, you work on it for three hours, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to stay at your desk that long, and then off to lunch or whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you come back in the afternoon, you work on it three or four more hours, and then it sits dormant overnight. That's what these were designed for. Okay, and then over weekend, it doesn't get touched at all, right? That's only five days of the week it, it gets seven hours of use, right? Then the weekends, it gets zero hours of use. Think of a server. The first person comes in the morning at 6, and they're hammering and accessing the file server, and the last person leaves at 8 p.m., right? And it's getting hit that entire day by all those many different users. And then what do we do at night? Back it up, right? That poor server, those drives are getting hit all the time. 
And what happened is we started putting these SATA drives in business environments for servers, and the failures were they were ha failing after a year, year and a half, two years. We're like, what's going on? All my drives are failing. And then all of a sudden, we'd lose two drives at once. And now your data's gone, right, if you're running RAID 5. Um, so be careful of using SATA. Now the good news is this isn't, this isn't as much, you know, maybe two years ago, two years from now I won't even have this slide in my deck anymore because SATA will be pretty much out of the market. But I think there's still some real entry-level SANS uh, NAS devices that are using this. And if it's for secondary data that doesn't get accessed very often, then this might still be a good use for you. But be aware, right? Be educated as you're looking. Be a sophisticated buyer as you're looking at different SAN technologies. Okay, <coughs> iSCSI. Um, Dan's already smiling because he knows where I'm going with this one. I'm not my favorite. iSCSI is not my favorite. I've been burned too many times by iSCSI. So, Understand, I'm a little jaded. I'm going to be up front. iSCSI is not my favorite. Now, 10 gig iSCSI, I think, fixes a lot of the problems that 1 gig iSCSI had. But 1 gig iSCSI, I, I'm not kidding, I got burned so many times on 1 gig iSCSI. So be careful with that 1 gig iSCSI. Who's running iSCSI 1 gig? Is it for high end applications or is it for. Okay, you're running 10 gig. There you go. All right. What about you guys? It's my VM environment. And you're running over 1 gig? And how, like, how many servers are you running against that? Mm, probably about 11 right now. Really? So, decent environment. Yeah, I've got three physical hosts, but I've got right. 11 virtual machines. And are you using just single gig, or are you using it bundled, or uh, uh, well, link I've, aggregation? I've, 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 yeah, I've got uh, a couple of switches stacked, and I've got two controllers, and okay. so I've got a lot of redundancy that I've built into Beautiful. It. And that gives you some performance. And again, it can work. It can work, but be careful. Where, where, where I see like a lot of problems is they'll just say, I'll VLAN off these four ports on my, my Ethernet switch. Do you have a dedicated Ethernet switch for iSCSI? Mm -hmm. Another reason he's not having problems, right? Where we see problems is they don't take the time to implement it properly. They're like, it's Ethernet. It's iSCSI. I already got an Ethernet switch. I'm not going to buy another switch. I've got open ports. So they'll carve off you know, six ports for their iSCSI. They'll VLAN it. Oh, it's on its own VLAN, so it's all safe now. And they'll put that on there and they'll run their iSCSI on it and man, do we have problems. And the SAN gets blamed and all everybody's the performance is bad. So again, my jading is not that iSCSI is a bad technology, but too many times it, it, it gets implemented poorly. It's a lot more reasonably priced though. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm going to get to a slide on that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Just uh, we sell thousands of iSCSI stores. Right, exactly. Thousands. They can do a pre um, site survey. Right. And that gets around most of what Dave's talking about. Right. You know, it is an nice because it's the way it's implemented. Yes. And Fiber Channel can be the same way it's implemented poorly. Right. Sure. So, again. Um, but the, the big difference with Fiber Channel is a lot of times it's a separate switch, right? It's not, I'm not going and, oh, I got open ports on my Ethernet switch I own, right? We that's buy a separate switch for that. Yep, exactly. You got it. Exactly. But regardless, in the end, it's so easy to implement poorly, right? I mean, that's the challenge. That's right, baby. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for that plug, Dan. The uh, <laughs> check's in the mail. All right. So, but what is it? What is iSCSI? Is we're just encapsulating, encapsulating, encapsulating iSCSI commands and data in a TCP IP packet. <coughs> And we're centering over a TCP network. Um, it is block level, right? So it's doing SCSI commands. So it has those advantages of being block level. It's not a file level technology like SIFS or NFS. Um, so it's like fiber channel, but it's using inexpensive Ethernet, right? And that's the attraction. It's Ethernet. We know Ethernet. We're comfortable with it. Our servers already have Ethernet NICs. Um, and so by leveraging that existing knowledge and technology, we can um, implement this uh, implement a SAN for less money. Um, but be careful on the performance. Be careful on that. So, um, some examples of this. When iSCSI first came out, we're like, oh, we'll just use our Ethernet NICs we're using. Well, there's a difference between, and the reason that fiber channel don't, doesn't call them NICs, I mean, isn't a fiber channel NIC like an Ethernet NIC, right? It's a it's a card goes in a PCI slot. It takes um, 
um, data that's moving around in the PCI bus and converts it into a packetized form and sends it out a, a port? Doesn't that sound like a NIC? So why doesn't Fiber Channel call their network adapters NICs? Because that's insulting to them. Because they are HBAs. They're host bus adapters. And there is a difference. A NIC, much of processing with a NIC is actually done with the CPU. A lot of the packetizing, the TCP header creation, is actually done with that Intel or AMD CPU. It's actually not done on the network adapter. Where with HBAs, that's the exact opposite. With HBAs, to the operating system, it's just storage. It just writes block data to the, to the, to the HBA, and the HBA does all that packetizing, breaks it up, puts it into, into, in, into the, uh, the uh, fiber channel format, and dumps it onto the fiber channel network. And so what we first started seeing is when uh, um, iSCSI was implemented, is all of a sudden our CPUs on our servers would spike. Right? And we'd, we'd see this big spike on the server and see someone nodding because now suddenly all that processing that was being done, you know, it wasn't being done at all. If we were writing to DAS or if we had Fiber Channel, it wasn't being done. Suddenly that got pushed to the CPU on the server. Now, one good thing today, in most VMware environments, CPU isn't as big of a deal as it used to be. Our CPUs are smoking fast, right? I mean, we've got six core. I mean, six core is like the standard now, right, for CPUs. And you can get 12 core um, for a higher end server. So CPUs are not, I mean, most of our VMware environments, um, and if you agree with this, please raise your hand, most of our VMware environments are um, memory bound, not CPU bound. Right? That's where we're seeing our challenges. Why do we think that with VMware 5 they tried to tie the licensing to memory? <laughs> right? Because it wasn't sockets anymore that was determining how big we could scale our environments. It was RAM was determining how big we could scale. So some of that concern of this overhead goes away, um, but it's still something to be aware of. So this is where I wanted the whiteboard. Um, this, I'm not drawing this to scale. I'm, this is for um, just to, to give an example of um, the proportions, but this obviously isn't to scale. But if you look at a, a fiber channel packet, a fiber channel frame, you might have something like this, right? You got header and payload. Okay, if you look at a TCP IP packet, it might look something more like this. Again, not to scale. I'm using this as, as, um, to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about here. So we had a lot more header. So here was, my ch here was one of the challenges with one gig iSCSI. As you go, okay, there's four gig fiber channel. I mean, that's what was really the standard when not one gig iSCSI. Was four, that was really your choice. Yes, there was two guy, gig iSCSI, but four gig was really strong when, when, I, uh, when iSCSI started taking off. Or one gig um, iSCSI, right? Four gig fiber channel, one gig iSCSI. And, and you go, well, it's four times as fast. Well, I would argue that it's more like six or seven times as fast. Because remember, all that matters is payload, right? Header is, is, is overhead. By definition, it's overhead. It gets thrown away when it gets to the other end of the link. So not only were we going from four gig down to one gig, but we were going from small header to big header relative to payload size, right? And so that made it fiber channel not four times as fast, but maybe five, six, seven times as fast when you calculate it in. Again, uh, it's, it, has, it can be properly implemented and it can be a great product, but be aware of these technical differences, right, when you're doing your calculations. So how did we try to fix this? Anybody know? MTU. Bingo. Jumbo frames, right? So what we said is we can't change the header size of TCP IP. That's a standard. It's, that's locked in. But we can buy a switch that can take a bigger payload. That's what jumbo frames are all about. So when I was wet behind the ears and I was, when iSCSI was out there and my customers first started implementing, I was running around, you got to do jumbo frames. Get a switch, make sure it does jumbo frames. That bit me in the rear. Again, all my bites from, from iSCSI, and here's why. 
this can actually backfire in structured data and database environments. Okay, and I learned this the hard way. I admit, I got a lot of scar tissue on me. Um, this can actually slow down and hurt performance in small IOP environments like databases. Because what can happen is the NIC can say, ah, I got all this room. I got to wait around. I'm going to queue and wait for some more packets or some more data to come before I send it off. So it'll actually sit there and hesitate and wait and try to fill, because I've only got this little right. The, the database just wants to do this little right. So I'll queue it and hold on to it until I can get some more payload in here. Well, guess what that does to your database performance? I mean, because your right commit isn't coming back, right? It says, hey, right. And the database, wait, I can't move till uh, my right commit comes back. Well, here, the NIC driver's holding on to that packet, waiting to put more payload in it. And your database performance just goes in the toilet. So be careful with jumbo frames. Great for like unstructured data, right? Where we're moving big files, video files, and all that, right? Because we're getting, moving big data. But if we've got a lot of small IOPS, jumble frames can actually damage your performance instead of helping it. So be careful with that. And then switch latency and buffer size. Um, one of the dangers of this, again, it's implementation. But what will happen is not only will we carve off a few ports on our existing Ethernet switch that we already have. Oh, by the way, that Ethernet switch is already busy with all the other stuff that it's doing, right? But we're going to give it a little more to do. And the switch isn't smart enough to prioritize, right? There are two different VLANs, and if, if there's a lot of broadcast going on and we have a problem on our data network, it's going to affect that storage network. But we also have seen situations where people go, well, that nice link switch, switch works just great. I'm going to put my fiber or my iSCSI on a Linksys switch. Okay, I've seen it done. Okay, the difference in latency and buffer size between an enterprise class switch and a cheap consumer grade switch is phenomenal. I mean, we're talking major differences in the performance of those switches. The again, fiber channel. This is why I'm a fiber channel bigot. Those fiber channel switches were made for storage. They realized we needed buffers and latency. We needed that, and so when you buy a fiber channel switch, it was built for, for storage. When you buy an Ethernet switch, it wasn't necessarily built for storage, right? And data transmissions can handle milliseconds of latency. Um, where switches, the fiber channel switches are in the microseconds of latency. So you've got to be a little careful in the quality of that Ethernet switch. Again, I'm guessing you're not using Links this or D-Link switches. No, he, he's smiling and he goes, no, right. He's got a dedicated switch and it's a good switch with low latency and deep buffers, right? That will get you a good iSCSI experience. So. I teach a lot and I, I explain um, that there's a reason that some switches are so much more expensive than others. It's not, I mean, sometimes they're like, 24 ports, gig ports, uh, 24 gig ports, it both has this, oh, they both have um, um, you know, fiber uplinks if you want them or whatever, right? And they look at the two switches and they're like, why is this one $2,000 and this one is $400? Well, this is an example of why there's a price difference. Um, it reminds me of a story is I was, I was interviewing, um, I was looking for a, a sales engineer and um, I, got, I, I always do like a phone interview first just to get a feel before I waste time meeting with the person, waste their time, waste my per time. I talk to the guy and I'm like, so are you more of a systems guy or a networking? Oh, I'm a networking guy. Great, great. So I'm thinking what kind of easy question I can ask. I'm like, okay, what's the difference between a hub and a switch? And his answer was, a switch is more expensive. And I'm like, is there anything else? I don't know. I'm like, thanks, man. He didn't get an in-person interview, right? If you're going to claim you're a networking guy, you better at least know the difference between a hub and a switch. But anyway, um, but price was the difference in, in his, his world. Any questions on that? Okay, so this is one of the challenges, though. HBAs are more expensive. This is part of that expense of a um, going to a fiber channel over an uh, iSCSI environment, right? Your HBAs are more expensive. And that, so the switch 
is probably more expensive, and then you got to put HBAs in all your servers, which is more expensive. So um, I'm not going to say that fiber channel is, sweet, is cheap, but it's not as expensive as you might think. And I'm going to the next slide. I'll show you that. But but the NIC is that cheap Ethernet NIC. Um, then in the middle is tow, so you should be aware of this. It's called TCP offload engine. And what that does is take some of the CPU processing off your Intel or AMD processor and pushes it into the NIC. Most NICs now are actually tow enabled. You can turn tow on. So you might want to look at that. If you're running iSCSI, can my NIC support tow and can I turn it on on those NICs? Now do it in a test environment first, make sure everything looks good, but this might be something to consider. The other th reason this is cheap is look at our servers now. I mean, servers now ship with a minimum of four Ethernet ports. I mean, I don't think you can order a business class server now without four. So they're building this all in. I mean, it's hard to resist. I get it. Um, just design it properly. But, and a lot of times those NICs you can turn on tow. For a while they were charging for that. You had to buy a license to turn it on. I think that's pretty much done on the different server manufacturers. There may be still some exceptions. So most times it's actually free to do this. So, so these two really become one, right? Tow is $1 sign, not $2 sign. But HBAs, they're $3 signs. You're looking at probably $1,000 a port for fiber channel. All right, here is another dollar chart. We actually ran these numbers, okay? We did this on a couple different manufacturers. We looked at Juniper, Cisco, uh, Brocade, Force 10. Um, I didn't really look at Force 10, but the Dell guys are here. <laughs> so um, I ran all, we ran it with multiple vendors, okay? And this is what we found is 10 gig was actually the most expensive today. And here's why. Again, I'm, there's situations where this might not be true, but in the situations we were looking at, you can't go and buy an eight port fiber channel, or an eight port 10 gig switch. You can't buy them. I can't, if somebody finds one, an eight port 10 gig switch, call me. I mean, I'll be your best friend. I'll take you to lunch for a month. Okay, I want a good deep buffer, low latency, eight port 10 gig switch. That would solve my, my uh, 10 gig iSCSI problem. But that's not out there right now. So like you go to Juniper and you can buy a, a, a switch that has two ports of 10 gig or even four ports of 10 gig. And, but of course then it has 24 ports of one gig. And we can't resist not using those ports. Right? We, it's just not in us, man. Oh, those ports are open. I can use that for something, right? I want a switch that only has eight ports of 10 gig. And four ports for most environments isn't enough. Eight ports is actually kind of a magic number. Many smaller environments, you've got a single SAN, a few hosts, eight ports of, of 10 gig or fiber channel is a magic number. Brocade. Well, let me finish Juniper. So either you get two or four, but that's on a ten or a, a gigabit switch, and there's they're really uplinks, or you go to 32 gig. Their next 10 gig option is a 32 port 10 gig switch. Do you know how many dollar signs a 32 port 10 gig switch is? Okay, it broke down. We couldn't find it, so we moved on to Brocade. Brocade actually has a little better story. Um, they have a 48 or 24 port switch, 10100, but they can do up to eight gigs of 10 gig on that switch. And that's pretty good if you need those other ports. And one thing that we're finding is more and more people are saying, you don't absolutely have to have a dedicated switch if you're running 10 gig. That it's not as, it's not required to have a dedicated switch. Um, because it's 10 gig, it's that, those switches are that much, I mean again, we're assuming a non-blocking, high performance, low latency switch with, with buffers. So it's not the same taboo, with, with one gig it was like dedicated switch, period. Um, we're seeing more and more people saying, you know what, you can get away with that. So I have a customer up in Idaho, we just did, implemented this and he loves it. He needed some one gig ports, but he only needed a few 10 gig ports for his, his, his ESX hosts, right? That's a common place we need 10 gig is on our VMware hosts, right? Instead of running eight, 10, uh, one gig ports on it, you know, we run a couple 10 gig ports to two different switches and we've got redundancy and high performance. Um, what we sold him was a pair of 
brocade switches that have eight 10 gig ports on them and then 48 PoE ports and he's running his ESX hosts, uh, iSCSI, 10 gig iSCSI on the 10 gig ports and then all his users and phones are on the PoE ports. Um, so that became more effective than Fiber Channel. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm full disclosure, there are situations where these two can switch, where this, this becomes cheaper, the 10 gig, but they're very specific cases. Um, until someone gets smart, and I've told all these manufacturers, produce an 8-port 10-gig switch with no other ports on it, just an 8-port 10-gig switch, and you're going you're gonna to take over the iSCSI world, right? If you can, you know, someone would produce that, in my opinion. They, for some reason, don't listen to me, so, um, so maybe I'm blowing hot air. But um, what we found in most cases, it actually can be cheaper to do 10-gig or 8-gig fiber channel than 10-gig. Um, so, and, yes. And another consideration uh, is, um, you know, we we talked about we talked about the hardware, you know, the cost of the hardware, and that's what I think this slide is really showing. Yes, it is we're, hardware. We're fiber channel guys, right? And you know, we've been with fiber channel. We know it's rock solid. True. We know it works. That takes some time to get up right. on fiber channel. Good point. And so there is a cost. Uh, so There's a management cost that I am not a good point, Doug, and he is right. I'm not accounting for the fact that we all are all know no um, Ethernet, right? We're all comfortable with Ethernet. We know Ethernet. A lot of us are like fiber channel. I don't know about HBA settings, right? I mean, you got to when you do your MPIO, you've got to make sure your your fiber channel settings are right and the timeouts and all that. So there is a learning curve. Um, I'm playing devil's advocate, a lot of the concepts are very similar though. Right? They have different names like zoning, right, and worldwide IDs. What's a worldwide ID? It's a MAC address, right, is really what it is in the storage world. What's a zone? I kind of think of it as a VLAN. Um, so the concepts still are pretty close, but I, I, absolutely there is a learning curve going to Fiber Channel. Who's got Fiber Channel? How tough is it to manage? I mean, be honest. Um, I really don't have technical stuff. We have a network engineer to manage okay. it. So, but what I've seen over his shoulder, it, it looks pretty simple. Okay, cool. Someone else raised their hand. Anyone? I've used Fiber Channel in a past job, uh -huh. so I know all about the zoning and the worldwide idea. Yeah, and all yeah, that stuff. yeah. Was it a, a steep learning curve, medium, we low? We have a consultant to come in and <laughs> help you. Stuff okay. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's where That's we're, there we go. You just sold me more engineering time. Did Dustin? We've got some more work to do. Right, right, right. All right, cool. All right. Any other, I mean, again, that's my spiel on iSCSI versus, I, I'm not, I, in the, I want to end it in saying, I think iSCSI is good. All right, I don't want it to make an impression that I think this is a stupid technology or something you shouldn't consider. I absolutely think it is a good technology and absolutely think it is something that you can, should consider, but just, know what the caveats are, right? Know where its weaknesses are and its strengths are and, and, and mitigate those weaknesses and have a successful project with that. Okay, yeah. From an admin's perspective, it's changing the battle from getting your corporate to understand there's going to be a cost there and you're not going to see all return on it. You're changing, I'm not going to be able to use all those ports because of the loss. You've right. got to have a separate environment. Right. You've got to get them to understand that. Right. And present right. It just it bothers people to see a switch with only four or five ports in use, right? And what? Your, your, your accounting guy comes in and says, why is this sitting alone? And he right. sees a loss of value to him. So right. yeah, but the security of my company is much higher. So. Right. Yeah, the big thing, um, I thought I had that on here. Is that a different slide? Where did I meant? Oh, ports on demand. I didn't really mention it on this slide. POD is what helps a lot on fiber channel. But honestly, most of the fiber channel switch, I said, hey, it's an eight port fiber channel switch. It's actually a 24 port. And they do what's called POD. It's really common now. In the, it's been in common in fiber channel world for years, and now the ethernet guys are picking up on it. Um, where ports on a demand simply means, I'm selling you a 24 port switch, but only eight of the ports are active, licensed on, and have optics in them, right? Fiber channel by definition is over fiber optic. The other 16 ports are inactive. They have no, H, uh, no SFPs in them, then no optics, no SFPs, and they're not licensed. And when you want to license them, you buy ports on demand. You buy eight more SFPs and the license, right? It's not just the SFP. You have to license the extra. That's become, is very common in the fiber channel world. We're starting to see it now on Ethernet. So uh, the example I gave on the brocade switches, 
to the customer up in Idaho, he actually only licensed four of the ten or four <coughs> of the eight ten gig ports for now until he gets a couple more ESX hosts and he needs them, and then he'll pay for the second group of four. So they actually are doing POD on the ten gig ports now, and we're seeing that. Yes. Is there any different um, benefit whether No, and, and uh, Russ isn't here, but Russ just did uh, an environment. I don't know if they're in here. Mark, wasn't one of your clients that just did a compellent SAN mostly Unix? Um, Linux? Actually, Blair, uh, was your database, right? So, one more in Linux. How did that, so sorry, I mean, I'm not to pick on you, but it's someone that's been through it. How has it been? I know uh, it was a little tougher for us. It took him a little while, but it's just because he doesn't see it as much. But we, the way we did it was the Oracle servers right now are standalone, so they'll go virtual. We're just okay. getting into the VMware side of it. So. Okay. Um, it'll be a little different when we get there, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad? No. So you had Oracle st servers that were standalone, and so you had to set up the MPIO so on the Linux? Just for the initiator okay. to, to see it in its few settings, and off you go. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't sound like it was that much yeah, more. They provided pretty good documentation. And a lot of times there is. There's a best practices doc or, or some kind of doc that talks about, okay, you're running uh, Linux. And I think there's even some differences between the flavors of Linux. Or is it the package that makes that difference? The package. The package. We've okay. Done, we've done mostly the Red Hat. The Red Hat. Okay. Yeah, we have both technologies running both operating systems. I just wondered if engineering-wise is there functionally any difference? No, not functionally. It's just different steps. And, and to be blunt, our guys see a lot more windows. So our engineers are, are, are quicker on the windows. Um, I think Russ even had to do some, on his own time, some research and get some help to, to get that straight. And, and, and again, the manufacturers are used to seeing it too. So it um, shouldn't be a big deal. Great question. Any others? OK. So hold on. That's the end of that one. Okay, so storage virtualization. Um, I wanted to just point this out. I'm a kind of a, a stickler about using names, right? Like if you ever get an email from me, I'm, I like to use a small b if it's bits and a big b if it's bytes, right? I try to be precise. This one bothers me. It's one of those ones that gets, you hear different definitions. So I just wanted to clarify this. Storage virtualization, there's two types that I see out there. The first type is basically glomming together separate storage systems, putting a system in front of it and making those independent islands of storage look like one big pool of storage, right? That's one definition of <coughs> storage virtualization. Can anybody name a manufacturer that's big into this? Nutanix. Is that what Nutanix is doing? Okay. Well, they use a VSA, right? Aren't they a virtual storage appliance? Uh, but, yes, but it has four right, right. It is. Data Core is, another, is one that's all software. Data Core, if you've ever heard of them, they put a, a device in front of it. The difference between Nutanix is that's all their hardware, and then they're, they're really doing more of a VSA, virtual storage appliance technology, whereas this is taking different manufacturers. I got an HP this and a Hitachi that and a Super Micro this, and I put a head in front of it all and glom all that storage together and look like it's one big SAN. Does the EMC do that with their ISLON? Can they put it in front of multiple br yeah. brands, different vendors? Then the there you go. Does. I don't know that product, but... IBM SPC. Is that what they do? Okay. So they've all got them. Data Core is a software solution that does it too. I actually know Dave Brown I used to work with him and somebody that does that. But that's one definition. This is really the more popular definition now when we talk storage virtualization um, is where we're, we're saying we don't have these little, it's kind of funny, is we had SANs. I mean, back when Doug and I first sold that first SAN, we were still carving up sets of disks for particular LUNs. We were still, so even though it was a big pool of storage, it still had some physical components to it. Meaning, I had to go and say, well, these five disks are part of LUN 1, and it's a RAID 5, and that one LUN is, is all it holds, or, or maybe it has more than one LUN, but those LUNs are 
isolated on that set of five discs. And then I carve out these ten discs and I say this is a RAID set and I can put LUNs on top of that but those LUNs only reside on that RAID set. Storage virtualization just gets away from that completely and it says a LUN can be across all of those. If we stop putting discs into RAID sets, we used to, you know, one thing I never hear anymore, hot disk. Right? Back in the day we used to talk about hot disks all the time and it's because we have the sand and a certain disk would be getting hammered and other disks would be sitting there dormant because the data was still isolated. It was better than direct attached storage where you got them completely separate but it still had some physical limitations, meaning it was tied to physical disk. With storage virtualization, and, and I think Doug will probably get into this a little more, what we do is we get rid of those barriers and we say all the disks are all one big pool and we can raid, lay RAID 10 on there, we can ra lay, raid LAID 5 on there, and it's just a pool of disk. And we can go across tiers, right, between 15K and 7.2K dr drives, for example. And here's the, the best example of this that I can give. Traditionally, an exchange database had to be on one set of disks, right? It was locked to that disk. And you either had to pick RAID 10 or RAID 5, and it was either 15K or 7.2K drives, right? And it was locked in that environment. With this storage virtualization, you can have a database exchange, in my example, that actually spans both 7.2K drives and 15K drives, that spans both RAID 10 and RAID 5, and it's one LUN. And the operating system is completely blind to this, has no idea this is going on. So what happens in that environment is instead of putting all our exchange on RAID 10, which is what we want to do because exchange gets hit, but we all know that 90% of that database is old emails that no one's ever going to look at again, but we need that performance for the writes and the active data. We can keep the active 10% on 15K at RAID 10 and have the stale stuff that no one's looking at down at RAID 5 on, on, on 7.2K drives. And it's all one database. I'm not talking about breaking the database into different and somehow doing that or how, how you have an archive mailbox that you have to put all your stuff in and that's really on, on um, 7.2K RAID 5. It's all invisible to the operating system. It's all invisible to the, to the application. Is that cool? I mean, so now you can leave, I mean, have we all tried to get people to delete stuff out of Exchange? Have we all tried to do mailbox limits? You know, it doesn't work. Exchange is, is or email is everybody's document management station. It's my document management station. I got a whole bunch of folders for all my clients, a, bunch, a whole bunch of folders for all my vendors, and I throw stuff in there and I keep it forever. I'd hate to ask Russ how big my mailbox is. But by using this storage virtualization, I don't have to do any manual moving data, whatever. It's doing it at a block level. And if this block hasn't been used and accessed, let's push it all the way down to 7.2K RAID 5. Where's that logic at? At the controller, it's part of the sand. That's built into the sand. <coughs> um, the other thing that's cool about this is, I, oh, go ahead. Just really quick, you, you can also span to like SSD too, right? You yes. Can span three generations. Yes, that is. So, so I, I'm, I'm trying not to be product specific, but I will. For like Dell, right now they support three tiers there may be some changes where that might increase. Um, but right now you could have SSD, a 15K and a 7.2K tier, absolutely, and spread across all of those. Um, the problem is, is SSD, there's two different kinds of SSD, well there's more than two, but the main one's uh, multi-level cell, I'm gonna get to this in single level cell. One is good for reads, one is good for writes, and so you really need four tiers, would be perfect. Um, maybe that'll happen someday, so. We'll see. When they ask where the logic is stored, is that on the data progression? Yeah, 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 on the data progression. So it's stored at the controller. It, well, it's really stored on each individual drive, takes up very small space, where it keeps the metadata on each individual block. Right. 
you still got that data together. Yep. But the controller is controlling that data movement, right, between those different tiers, moving those blocks around. Oh, this is a stale block. Let's move it down. Oh, this block suddenly got popular. Let's bring that block back up to a higher tier. Yes? What's your thought on the, the CAD, like the balance system, the cash card versus SSD? The good question. So, is, um, so cash cards are usually... Um, well, now they're becoming more and more non-volatile, right? Now they're, they're either battery-backed or they're non-volatile. It, it, it's a hard separation between the two. Usually, with the SSD, you can get more of it, right? I mean, that's a primary difference. The cash card, or the cash built into the controller is usually a fixed amount that cannot be changed. Um, whereas with adding the flash to the, the SAN itself, you can scale that over time. Yes. Recently, what you're going to use a cash card for traditional sounds? I work for EMC, IBM. I've sold that. So, what you're going to use that for for performance? So, as you're doing a lot of writes into the box, if you don't have enough spindles behind it to handle, let's say, in a specific fixed rate set, that cash has got to handle that and, and then do the writes. Yeah. Right. With, with compellent, uh, or, or I'm just saying the way we virtualize it is. If you have enough spindles on the back end to handle the number of IOPS, and Doug's going to talk about that, the cash isn't really necessary. Right. It, it comes with it. Um, it can go anywhere from 16 uh, gigabytes up to a terabyte amount of cash. But we've never sold anything with the lowest amount of cash because we fix that problem with the spindle count. But what I mean, what would you con contrast between SSD and? and cash. I mean, aren't they both really a kind of cash? I mean, I'm having a hard time answering your question yeah. because... Well, I mean, yeah, you're on the right same thought process here. Because I think it's just the scalability of it, yeah. right? I mean, Doug, what's, I mean, what was your opinion is the difference between cash built into the controller and adding yeah, SSD? I'm sorry? It's much faster. And I've got right. a slide that kind of shows the performance all the way down through the different layers. layers. Let's table that one then, cash, Cole, cash or is Carson. Being, I mean, that's thrown out there as a term, and it's, it's kind of uh, moving you know, into different layers of, that, uh, of those options that you have out there. But uh, I've got a slide that we can... And I'm guessing your cache in the controller is much more expensive even than SSD. Oh, yeah. yeah, see, I mean, there's another difference. This is the cost of it. Everybody's cash is going to be. Yeah, exactly. A absolutely. Yeah. Yes. There's some other things to keep in mind, too. Some uh, SANs only use SSDs for read caching and will not write to them. Right. And there's other SANs that will you know, you know, use the caching you know, for re reads and writes. Right. But then there's also other things that you can do to improve performance as well by not even hitting the SAN by putting cache on the server side, such right. as the stuff that VMware supports where you got your host side caching now. Right. And Doug's going to go big. We're kind of stealing a little Doug's thunder right now because I believe Doug is. <laughs> <laughs> I believe Doug is going to go into this pretty pretty in depth. We'll talk about. Some okay. Time. Cool. Perfect. Great questions. Thank you. And, and one of the reasons, we'll get to a slide I'll touch on, one of the reasons that some only do read and write and write, we're going to talk about the different types of SSD that drive some of that. And there's the uh, storage tiering windows that you have <coughs> to too. Because right. right. even though you have SSDs in there for read caching, it may take up to 24 hours to have hot data move up to it. Sure. Yep. Right, it's got to move between those tiers. All right, so thin provisioning. Um, again, just a quick, it, it comes up when you're looking at SANS, I want to make sure everybody knows what it is, is basically as we tell, you know, what, what happens when someone needs a new server? Well, how big is it? Well, it's going to be two terabytes. Well, how big is it going to be this year? Well, it's only going to be, it's 50 meg, right? It's going to grow though, I mean, it's going to grow, you've got to give me two terabytes. You go, okay, here's your two terabytes, wink, wink. Right? The operating system sees two terabytes presented to it. It lays its file system down on two terabytes. In reality, we're only consuming the 50 meg on the back on, on the SAN. And then as that grows, as that partition or LUN grows, it'll consume more disk. 
Traditionally, we'd have to tie up all two terabytes, right? We'd hand it to that server, and that server would hold all two terabytes. What happens to the price of storage over time? Big time, right? Okay, now the reason that SANs haven't got cheaper is because they keep on getting bigger, right? I mean, because we need more data, but the actual price per gig or terabyte is, is like this, right? And so, why buy it now when they don't need it for two or three years? Buy it when it's cheaper. That's what thin provisioning is all about, right? Let the server think it has the full two terabytes, but you don't have to buy the Discord. Now, you better have good alerting on your SAN so you know when they're actually starting to consume that so you can get disk in there and stay ahead of it, right? Better be careful of that. Um, that's the, the gotcha. You better be monitoring your free space on your SAN and staying ahead of it. Yes? The other reason why you want to do thin provisioning and prolong that um, purchase of this is if I have to buy it, I'm using today's cost of money. I have to rack it, you know, provide space for it. Power it. Power it and cool it which is all a, a cost. It isn't actually the cost and manage it. Right. Uh, the cost of disk isn't, isn't what you should be looking at. You should be looking at your total cost of ownership, which is including managing it. Right, it. right. So you got all that, all that empty disk, but it's all powered up, you're all spinning away, generating heat, and you're not even That's using traditional it. Traditional SANS do right. that. The traditional ones that we've talked about in here today, they, they do what we call fat provision. <coughs> No. But yes. it's like the other oh. side, you said, you, you've got to manage that lie. You're lying, now right. you've got to make sure that you manage. <laughs> when, they, uh, when they start consuming that two terabytes, you better stay ahead of it, right? You better be adding disk, but buy it as you need it. Yes? Well, and on that line as well, when you're staying ahead and you're adding in a few more disks here and there to keep ahead of that motion, you got to be sure to be rebalancing oh, absolutely. your disks as well. Oh, yeah, or else absolutely. They're going to be shoving all of that data on right. a few spindles. Right. And that's actually part of the process. So when our engineers go out and do a, add additional drives or even a full shelf um, to a SAN, that's actually part of the process at the end when it's all physically there. We're not done with the project until everything's rebalanced. And that's the term. That's the exact term is rebalancing. You gotta move, you gotta spread that data out like peanut butter. To get all those advantages I talked about about storage virtualization, definition two, right? You gotta spread it across all those disks so you get all the IOPS spread across all the LUNs, you get your best performance possible. Yes? What are the, what are the downsides of thin provisioning? How are you doing? Um, getting caught with your pants down and not staying in front of the storage. I mean, that's really the only danger I'm real aware of. I've never seen a other problem than that. There's not a good management for your quarter. Um, that could be an issue if you've got to sit there and manage it and come in every day and look at it. So again, with what, what we provide here with thin provisioning is, man, you, you've got to have a pool, right, of, of extra, right? So as people consume a block, they be able to go out that pool and grab a block and write to it and have that. But you've got to have watermarks at a certain level. You get alerted. You have alerts that either come in email, texts, um, and, and you want those, as this gentleman said, you want to have those far enough in advance that you, number one, can get management to give you money to buy more, and number two, to be able to install that and have it in balance. All right, and you can see trending. I mean, if you've got a good reporter tool, um, it'll show you trending. You can predict out when you're going to need to add disk. We have a rule of thumb. 70% get alerted, start looking for the money, right? When your SAN is 70% full, you should get an alert. Um, and, and this is conservative. I mean, some people would say I would get alerted 60% or 50%, but at, uh, this is worst case. I mean, do this or better. 70% um, get alerted. We need, to st we need to start budgeting for this. 80%, you better have a PO working in the works. And 90%, you're in trouble. You need to, you, and it, this isn't just in provisioning. This is just the general functioning of any SAN. SANs need room to rebalance, right? They've got to have buffer space to move blocks around so they can stay efficient. And when they get over 90%, they start getting constrained and I can't move stuff around. And also the performance actually starts hurting. In fact, it can be substantial. So we have this rule is when I see a SAN over 90%, I start, hey, <laughs> you know, you know, you're going to have a problem here uh, sooner than later. And our service guy, we call him co-pilot, you know, guys that live in the even prairie, you know, so to speak English, you know, you have this dial home feature, okay, 
and they're looking at your sands all the time. And they have gas gauges out there. We get the gas gauges. We can I get the gas gauges. He gets the gas gauges for his customers. So we're always looking for green, yellow, and red. And, and we have a lot of customers that stay in the red. They love to freaking roll the dice, you know. But we're always going out there, hey, <laughs> don't come to this one. Baby. What the right stop. Red line. Favorite color. Yeah, exactly. They just, yeah, let's see. Oh. Missed it that time. Hold on. I can get it. I can get it. So, so that, that's another downside is that you have so much flexibility and so much insight into it is you, you start thinking that you can really play it and stretch it. And it will occasionally bite you. Yeah, that's your danger. And you were going to, you had a point. Like you said, we did run into an instance with thin provisioning with uh, VMotion and VMware. Uh, if you have too many thin, thin provisioned servers on a, on a host that dies, it doesn't. Have you ever heard of that one? Okay, okay. I've never seen that happen before. That's cool. Or that's interesting, not cool, but you, you run that sucks, but and you're really, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's more than just the fact that you run that space. Right, right. It, it, you've really got to manage that light. And that's the only downside, is they're a little bit more management. But there's tools out there in any of the sins that will hopefully help you manage that loss, right? And that's, that's you know, the downsides that... What we did at TNS is we, we actually flat feed our installs on our SANS. We, we do a flat fee. So no one's sitting there going, you know, we, we, you can get this done in five hours, right? You're charging me per hour. They want to get you the heck out of, the, out of there. So we flat fee our installs. And one of the reasons we flat fee our installs is I want Enterprise Manager, which is Dell's management tool, installed. It's free. It's included. But it's one of those important but not urgent things, right? Management stations a lot of times don't get implemented, right? Um, I mean, it's like, like uh, we're, uh, uh, sorry. HP servers. Uh, Dell, uh, what's yours? Open, open manage on your servers? I don't know. Well, in, in HP's world, it's System Insight Manager. It's this great free tool for managing the servers. 70% of my clients don't implement it, and it's free. And it's a good, it'll warn you when a drive, most people, not most, a lot of people, the way they find out a hard drive failed is they walk in the data center. Whoa, red light, <laughs> right? Okay, well, System Insight Manager will alert you before the drive even fails, because usually drives don't fail quietly. They usually start having head crashes and, and same with RAM and CPUs. But they don't use those tools. So what we did to help with this is we made a flat feed install, and part of that flat feed install is we install, we do two things. Number one, we make sure the co-pilot works, right? The phone home, so that you get a, the co-pilot knows when your hard drive fails, and they immediately just overnight one to you. Um, and number two, we have the enterprise manager up and running, so that you have all those historical data. You can see trending. You can get alerts, things like. That. In general, it's way worth the risk. In general, the small risk, it's way worth it. Okay, snapshots. Um, I like to do this example. Because not everybody totally understands snapshot. I know some of you are going to be like, Dave, this is boring. I guess most of my presentation was that way but for some of you. But let me just really quick draw my, again, this is for illustration purposes. Is this really how the, exactly how the technology is working? Not exactly, but this is a really um, good way to look at it. So you got disk. You got storage out there. And you're writing to blocks. You're writing data to the blocks, okay? And what you want to do is you want to do a snapshot. I want to freeze that data. I want to be able to roll back to that. Some examples would be, I want to apply patches, and if it goes bad on me, I want to be able to roll back to the operating, the, how the data and server looked before I applied the patch. Or a dev team says, I want to change our application and I want to do it on the real data on the real server, you know, and, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. Well, let's spin up a, a copy of the server. You can use snapshots for that. So how does it work? So you're writing your data. What happens is you suddenly say, snap, at 12 noon, say. At that point, again, different tech, different vendors do things slightly different, but in general, conceptually, this is what happens. We freeze all those blocks. Those blocks become read only. And then what we do is, as we write new data, or if we change some of this data, what we do is we don't go in and change that block, 
we create a new block with the changes and have a pointer to that, right? So what happens is we keep on writing, and if we're writing this data, again, we don't change it, we just write the delta changes over here and point on it. And so now I've got, uh, I drew too many dots, I'm gonna draw a few less. I've got two copies of my data, but did I double my storage use? All that's over here in green is the deltas. Then again, at 3 p.m., I do another snap. And now that data, that data and that data is frozen. Okay? And now I start writing the deltas again. So what does the data look like right now? This plus this plus this. What does the data look like at noon? This plus this. Or no, hold on. Just Sorry. The yeah. Just you, the black. Yeah. Just the black is what it looked like at noon. At 3 p.m. it's this plus this. And now, yeah, that's the right word. Now it's all three of them. That's how snapshotting works in a conceptual manner. That's how we don't. Now, what happens is eventually we want to retire a snapshot. I don't need this 12 noon anymore, right? We know we've got past that. I only really need one version back, right? I know we're safe. I want to rec because does this use extra space? Yes. Does it double the space on your SAN? Absolutely no. But does the keeping those delta files and the original or blocks, delta blocks and the original blocks increase your storage? Yes. But it's just the delta. But it does use space. So eventually you say, I don't need this 12 noon anymore. So what happens is these green blocks get committed, exactly. And they either become, if they were brand new data, they become black, or, oh, we gotta change that block. And, oh, that block gets changed, okay. And now our snap is committed, we've recouped that space, and we go on our merry way. But we've lost what it looked like at noon. That's no longer recoverable. Yes. So now let's move forward a little. And now we did another snapshot at 6 p.m. We've lost our noon, but now we've got these. And now, now is any new changes. The developers come and say, hey, I want to try this new change to our application. Instead of building a development environment and building a server and trying to make it look like the production environment, we mount the 6 p.m. snap again, right? So this is being used for production, but we can mount it again on another server, and they have another host, and now we have another copy of it, and I don't have a, another color. Ooh, do I? Okay, that's black. Same color. All right, so I'm going to use black again. So they've got the 6 p.m. mounted, and then they can access that server. It obviously needs to be in a isolated environment because it's going to have the same IP address, same server name, but what a great testing device, so to speak. And they can make their changes over here. So this plus this plus this is what the production environment looks like. This plus this plus this is looks what the devs and copy of the 6 p.m. with their changes looks like. And when they're done with their dev testing, they just delete the snap. And it's gone and we haven't affected. And what a great copy of the data. They had, they had the real server mounted. So yes. we have like eight copies of a four terabyte database yeah. that test refuses to, to do on snapshots because they're concerned that it's not an actual production environment. Okay. And so I mean we only have you know, this is done all the time. For, right. Uh, all the rest of them are dead and Right. And how much they're, space they're, is they're being used? Well this is an actual uh, yeah. uh, getting, them, getting them over that that uh, mentality of dead fear on uh, if maybe if you explain it to them like this, they can get it. I don't know. That's the best. That, that's the best way for me to understand it. That what the picture I just went through. How, what about fragmentation? How does Sam deal with fragmentation? That's built in. That's that that. You got to be careful now. There's operating system level fragmentation, and then there's how the disks are writing it. And and Doug, then you're starting to get a little over my head now. My the fact that I'm a sales guy now is starting to show because I don't mm -hmm. know. Exactly how that happened. Years ago, we used to you know defrag everything, and anymore the, the disk and the ways that they lay it out, as uh, he was talking about, is uh, the, the fragmentation is not an issue as as it was at one point in time in a SAN environment. 
But I think you still have your operating system level defrag, and you know, and operating systems even are getting bit better at proactively cleaning that up. Did you just start talking about deleting this, right, changing right. those rounds. It actually it, the, uh, the SAN is doing these rebalancing functions. The SAN actually does do housekeeping all the time. There's actually these back-end housekeeping. Things like data progression where we're, we're taking old stale blocks off of the high-performance disk and moving it down to the, to the lower-performing disk. RAID rebalancing. I hate to use the word, but defragging, right? That's all part of a housekeeping function of the SAN that you don't even care about. I mean, it's just... Have it on all SANs? All, um, no. Yeah, Older SANs, this was a big problem. Older SANs, we'd, I mean, like I told you, we'd have hot disks because, you know, the data wasn't being properly smoothed across all the disks, and so we'd have this poor disk that's getting hammered, which then would slow down the performance of everything. So, yes, is there still some of that cheaper legacy stuff, either, either expensive legacy or cheap current that might still have some of those issues? Absolutely. But your business class SANs... Yeah, are going to take care of that. Another, we're, we're wrapping up here. Another um, um, feature SANS might have is remote re replication, but there is two ways of doing it. You can replicate at a host base. So the challenge with SAN based replication is you almost always have to have the same brand SAN in both locations. That may change someday. Um, with some big manufacturers that have bought multiple SAN products and maybe they can have a cheaper one out at the edge and a more expensive one in the core. But today it's pretty much like to like. That will get better over time. If you don't have like to like, then your choice is host based replication. But um, again, the SAN base is more efficient because it's down at the hardware level and it's not affecting your host. You're not running double take on your host to do that replication. The SAN takes care of it for, for you. So I don't want to steal too much of. Doug's um, thunder, but just real quick, flash drive technology, SSD. It's really a hot topic right now. There's all kinds of little startups popping up that's SSD, this is the way to go. Um, there absolutely is advantages SSD, um, but it's like everything else, there's nuances, right? And just get educated on this. Don't let uh, a sales guy come in and, and buffalo you and just kind of, oh, it's got to be SSD, it's the only thing. Um, because number one, they may not be selling you the right kind of SSD, and number two, you might not even need it. I mean, the classic example is, you know, your IOPS, your IOPS are, you know, 2,000 IOPS, right, is your peak. And they go in and they sell you a SAM with 100,000 IOPS. That's like you buy a uh, Maserati and, and you only drive around your neighborhood at 25 miles an hour. I mean, it's just, why did you spend all that money? I mean, yeah, there you go, on Legacy at 55. So, um, so just be aware, SSD has got a great position. We see SSD um, really becoming prominent in the market, but use it where you need it. Um, the advantages, the access time, Right is extreme. It's it, we start going into the milliseconds or micro sorry microseconds with this technology instead of milliseconds with traditional. Um, the interfaces can be SAS, can look like just like a hard drive, or it can be PCIe where it's a a card s s punching into the 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 uh, PCI slot on your server. Um, be careful. There's a huge difference between enterprise and commercial. Um, I don't want to get into it, we don't have time, but some examples are enterprise drives will have a whole pool, they'll say it's a one terabyte drive, but there's really 1.3 terabytes in there, and it's got 0.3 terabytes sitting in there to replace worn out cells. That's what's weird about SSD, the cells wear out, right? That might be a difference between a enterprise and a commercial, or, or sorry, an enterprise and a consumer SSD. So the consumer one, it starts wearing, you're hitting it hard, it's in the server, it runs out of spare cells and then the drive fails. Hey, I'm not a one terabyte drive anymore, yes? Yeah, most of the commercial drives now, they call it over provisioning, and right. you know, they only over provision about 7%. Okay. Yep. Whereas enterprise drives still are upwards to 25% or even higher. Right. So, I mean, again, I don't want to get into all the nuances. Google it, right? Google SSD, 
um, enterprise versus consumer, and, and you'll find all kinds of articles on this. This isn't just you know make believe. This is real. There's real technical differences. There's also the big difference between MLC and SLC, right? And it, um, intertwined, but they're actually two separate, right? There's consumer MLC and consumer uh, or an enterprise MLC, <coughs> right? So so these aren't directly correlated, but understand the difference between MLC and SLC. And are you going to touch on that in yours? So Okay, so I'm just going to blow right by that one. Um, last point, ML, sorry, did I say ML? Sorry, I got a typo there. There's my typo. See, I shouldn't have been doing this yesterday. MLC is, is better for reads. SLC is, uh, in general, is better for writes. Um, data du 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 duplication, we all know what that is, right? That's just removing duplicate data. My point on this disk is that traditionally it's only been in our disk to disk to tape backup scenarios. It's coming in primary. But I'm going to do another big wave of the arms. Be careful. Okay, by definition, it's going to start affecting performance, right? It's a form of compression. I mean, you, I mean, they can tell me all day long it's not compression. I'm going to argue it's a form of compression, right? And what does compression do to performance on hard disks? Why do we not go and compress our C drives on our servers? Performance, right? Now, they're going to try, they're going to overcome this CPU processing, right? Because it's, it's, it's CPU intensive are getting stronger, and so some of these performance issues are going to be reduced, but just be aware of it. It's not this nirvana. Where I think data dedupe is going to be really powerful is in that stale data, right? That stuff we pushed to tier three, let's even crush it down more, right? We've already moved it to cheaper disk, now let's dedupe it at tier three. Or tier four. Or tier four. If it tells you anything, uh, exchange no longer dedupes right. attachments. Yep. Yep, that's absolutely true. That's why they now support 7.2K drives. So Exchange 2010, I think, is when they made that flip. They got rid of single instance store. That's what Exchange did. They got rid of a single instance store, and they said, if someone sends out an attachment to 10 people, I'm going to store that attachment 10 times now. Before Exchange 2010, it stored one copy and then pointers, right? So it was, in my opinion, deduping, right? Um, they cut that out because of performance. And because Exchange used to be officially supported, best practices was 15K drives only. With Exchange 2010, they officially came out and said, we will support it on 7.2K because of that change. And they changed some other things in the database. But exactly, great point, thank you. All right, HSM, hierarchical storage management. The only reason I wanted to talk about this is this is dying, in my opinion. Um, anybody use Semantic Enterprise Vault? That was the big name in this area. Um, Enterprise Vault, what it does is it's trying to do, before the SANS could do it, is tear the data off the primary storage, leave a pointer to it, and stick it somewhere else. And then if someone, so it looked like the file was still there, and if someone wanted to access it, they'd click on the pointer, and then it would go grab that and pull it back. And there were some other tricks it would do, et cetera. All right, that's what HSM was. It was intrusive. Think about it. It's going around and it's mucking with your files. And we've seen all kinds of crazy stuff go wrong with it. Um, a compelling customer had it, and I, we sold him the, the Enterprise Vault, and it started messing with uh, Adobe files because he had some security thing turned on Adobe, and it was wrecking things for him. He eventually yanked it. You guys yanked it because it was messing with your Revit files, right? Wasn't that what the problem was? This goes away with data progression in, in Dell's world, right? Have it invisible to the operating system. Move the blocks back there at the hardware level at the SAN and not have this intrusive HSM software actually ripping the files out and leaving stubs behind because it causes problems. It causes, because we don't know, the HSM can't possibly know all the in, you know, interactions of that file um, to do that. So. Um, server virtualization, uh, the only, the beginning, again, this is a 101. Why are SANS? The, the, the point I want to make on this whole slide is there are so many customers that 10 years ago I would I mean, would have never even considered a SAN. I mean, the SANS were just unattainable. There wasn't a value to them. They just weren't a discussion. Now, my smallest customers are looking at SAN technologies. And why? 
virtualization. That was the number one. That was such a boom for Compellent and all the other storage vendors. This was a huge boom for them because you got to have multiple ESX servers if you're VMware or Hyper-V servers, whatever, and you need to have shared storage to allow a lot of the features that you get. And best practice server virtualization design, guess what? This is the same slide I had before. Okay, it works. That's the design we do in server virtualization environments, right? You got your VMs, your VMDKs are all down here on the SAN, and then I can spin them up on either one of these, or if I got 10 servers, um, very common design for server virtualization. Okay, any last questions before I bail?